Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. Across the world, one of the biggest changes forced by the COVID-19 pandemic was in the field of education. Nearly all programs were rapidly moved to a distance learning module. Online and remote instruction has its own unique challenges, and that was certainly true here at Mayo Clinic. Joining us to discuss education in the time of COVID-19 is the Dean for Student Affairs in the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine in Minnesota, Dr. Alexandra Wolanski-Spinner. Welcome to the program, Dr. Spinner. Thank you very much, Dr. Kakar. Happy to be here. So pre-COVID-19, tell us about what medical school education uh, was like. Interestingly, medical education has not changed very much for over 100 years. Uh, but back in 1910, Dr. Flexner produced a report that described how medical education should be optimized. So before that, we thought of the um, apprenticeship model where medical students or other individuals who were trained to become doctors were essentially at the bedside of the patient together with the doctor. And so they learned uh, through modeling and demonstration. But he determined that it was important to establish some foundational principles. And so medical school from that point on became what it is currently today, two years uh, of uh, scientific foundation. So within the classroom, uh, anatomy, dissections, uh, pathology, uh, uh, and then just essentially the main sort of organ systems. And then the following two years are actually at the bedside. So the clinical portion of the training where students are now learning um, really side by side with physicians. So traditionally, uh, as you said, there's, there's four years. H how many medical students are actually in, involved in classroom education and also in hospital rotations? So within the Mayo Clinic, we actually have a relatively small medical school. As you know, we do have three campuses, a campus in Arizona and a campus in Florida as well. The Florida campus uh, is a two-year campus. It's a clinical campus, so years three and four. The Arizona campus is a full four-year campus, and actually they'll be graduating their first class in 2021. So if you include uh, all, all uh, individuals within the school, we have roughly 100 to 108 medical students per year. Multiply that by four. Within uh, the Minnesota campus, we have roughly 54 students per year. And so years one and two, about 110 individuals in the classroom and the same amount uh, within clinical rotation. So either in the outpatient clinics or in the hospitals. So clearly, that's, that's a lot of students uh, across, not just in, uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, but across the country. And that takes a lot of organization to ensure that educational needs are met. Yes. And then March happened. And so tell us yes. what happened there to ensure yes. that their education was done safely. Quite early on, the uh, AAMC, which is the Accrediting Association of Medical Colleges, which oversees medical education in the United States and in Canada, uh, essentially released some recommendations. And they felt that it was important to actually pull medical students from clinical rotations to essentially uh, optimize their safety in the setting of COVID, especially in a very fluid situation where issues such as PPE were becoming problematic. And so we did in fact follow suit. And so early on by about mid-March, students were pulled from clinical rotations uh, and subsequently students were actually pulled as well from the on-campus large classrooms, 50 plus individuals all huddled together setting because of the, the potential risks associated with that. It was quite incredible to see the resilience of our faculty, of our students, of our administrative staff, really of everyone, our leadership in the medical school. We just sort of all pulled together and made it happen. And so our Dean of Academic Affairs, Dr. Darcy Reed, uh, quickly transitioned all of their learning virtually. So let me explain what that meant. For the first two years where most of the education is within the classroom setting, essentially lectures were taught through Blackboard or Zoom, and our faculty really stepped up. They were extraordinary. Um, and so exams could be delivered, obviously, remotely, that kind of thing. For students who were in clinical rotations, as I stated, they were pulled. And then quite quickly, uh, what, we, uh, what the, the academic affairs branch was able to do is develop virtual alternatives. So for example, there was a module that was created regarding COVID. And so what aspects of medical education were important to, uh, to be taught in that setting? Typically, those who are at the bedside were transitioned to what we call hybrid rotations, where they were going to do a portion virtually, and as soon as the clinics were opened, the rest was going to be completed at the bedside. There's one point I want to make about that. The majority of medical schools across the country to continue advancing the student in their curriculum switched to all virtual learning, which meant that a large number of medical students really never may have had that clinical exposure to some core rotations. But we at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine the leadership discussed it and we felt that our priorities were twofold. One was to really prepare students to be, to be uh, well-prepared physicians. So to make sure that we did not decrease those core 
educational um, opportunities to, to make sure they were very competent. And second is to keep the students safe. We were happy to, to, to find out that actually our students are returning to the clinic in June. And so now having completed, for example, a few weeks of psychiatry virtually, they're gonna be going to the bedside currently. Um, we think that that will advantage them as well in our match, uh, but more importantly, that it's preparing them to be competent physicians. It's a great point that you make. I mean, uh, in terms of the hands-on uh, education is critical, not only for the students, but the patients themselves. I think the patients really enjoy that. And as the practice is opening up safely, as we've seen, as you said, through June, uh, the students will be back. I think that's a, that's a welcome uh, relief for them. But tell us, you know, education can be stressful. And, yes. uh, you know, wellness is, a, is an important part of how our students uh, go through their training. What have you done in the medical school to ensure the, the, the wellness of our students? We built a program a few years ago called the Thrive Program, uh, which essentially is an acronym that um, stands for training uh, medical students to become uh, humanistic, um, uh, professional individuals who are resilient uh, and healthy. Uh, who are innovative thought leaders uh, and who also experience individualized success to be vocationally excellent. And so we don't view our responsibility to end when they graduate. Our responsibility is to launch them in their careers. I wish that I had been taught self-care when I was going through medical school and residency and fellowship. And so we feel that knowledge and procedures are important, but that concept of how do you balance self-care so that you can actually be more effective as a physician uh, and, and decrease the chances of, of burnout, which we know is associated with inferior patient outcomes. But we were lucky because we already had a strong program in place. And so what we did is we just transitioned it to being virtual. So we created opportunities for check-ins on Zoom for our students. We have a program called CWA Student Initiated Wellness Activities, where students can apply for $250 to participate in wellness activities. And they've been very creative from baking to you know, basketball tournaments to uh, dragon racing up in the cities, which I, I admit I had to look up. It's a dragon boat that you race. I didn't know what that was, but now they're doing it virtually. So they're buying online games that they can then engage with one another and check-ins where they all order a cookbook and then put the recipe together at the same time. Uh, we also uh, uh, make sure to be interfacing with them. So we have virtual hours where they can connect with us, town halls, class meetings where everybody comes together because that social support is so important, especially during COVID where people feel isolated. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that about the social distancing and, and things like that. But you, as you said, uh, everybody is innovated and actually now the touch points and human connection through technology and virtual learning is actually probably enhanced their education as opposed to uh, previously where you're sort of all uh, pigeonholed and doing several things at the same time. It's so true. You bring up a really good point. And I think what we've discovered within medical education is that there are pearls and silver linings to be gained, and we plan to continue to implement those going forward. Now you mentioned, Dr. Walensky Spinner, about the match. Can you tell people about what the, the, the match actually is? Many not, sure. may not be familiar with that. Sure. So the match essentially is referring to uh, a, um, a process through which uh, senior medical students choose a specialty and then go through uh, application process and interview process to eventually match into residency. Uh, so medical school is foundational, but then, and, and is essentially the same for all students within a school, but then they decide what they want to become. Do they want to be an orthopedist such as yourself? Do they want to be a hematologist such as myself, et cetera? And so there's obviously many specialties they can pick from. And so that is what the match refers to. Uh, and uh, the actual matching process occurs uh, in March uh, when they find out where they're going to be going. Now that takes a lot of traveling, as you can imagine, uh, traveling for uh, electives to explore programs, what we call additional electives, especially in, in competitive surgical fields, orthopedics, neurosurgery, plastics, et cetera. But the second dimension is travel for interviews. Uh, and so once again, the AAMC, to their credit, as well as other accrediting bodies, have stated that they do not recommend any uh, in-person interviews. They're going to be virtual. And they have also recommended that there be no, uh, at a distance, if you will, audition electives. And so we are having to strategize in different ways. We're so lucky that our students are at Mayo because they can easily extend their training time within the specialty in fourth year from one month to two months. We have the capacity, we have top programs in all specialties. It's harder for smaller institutions who maybe rely on community hospitals or affiliates who perhaps do not welcome medical students because they are dealing with their own crises during COVID. And so 
it's different. Students are nervous. We don't know what it's going to be. We're still, we're building our bridges. We're walking across it this year. But as you said, this may be something that's here to stay. And it's like a hybrid program where you have a little bit of virtual, but also face-to-face -face connection. Because as you said, uh, the travel aspect, the time aspect, uh, that, that, that's a lot of dedication for the students yep. to, to come back and, and forth. And expensive. So on Absolutely. average, students spend uh, over $5,000 during the interview process. Wow. Uh, Alex, anything else that we should talk about that we didn't touch upon? Um, I'll just say that it has been a learning experience for all of us. I think that we have gone through the four stages of grief during COVID. I'm glad to say that I feel that we're on the other side, hopefully. And we're looking on how we can actually thrive through this. I think that for our students, just like for all children and teenagers who are having to adjust to virtual learning. Uh, they've learned to be more reliant, uh, self-reliant. Uh, they've learned to be more self-accountable. And I think that it's taught them a tremendous amount of resilience, which I think ultimately leads to better mental health uh, and more, more joy and happiness in life. So again, perhaps another silver lining. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Alexandra Wolanski spinner Dean for Student Affairs at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine in Minnesota, who's been talking to us today about how innovative measures have been taken to protect our students and ensure the well-being of their education. Dr. Alexandra Wolanski spinner thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me today. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all the Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.